Um, we're going to start session two, which is another panel on um, evidence of uh, state infringement. Uh, before we do, just a couple of housekeeping reminders. Um, first, for the panelists, uh, if you could just please remember when you're not speaking to um, to, to mute your microphone uh, to avoid you know any extraneous noise. Um, secondly, uh, just a reminder for those um, watching on the on the public link, we are. Um, if you're interested in signing up to participate in the open mic session at the end of the day, um, you can do so at the link that uh, should be provided in the chat here shortly um, uh, on SurveyMonkey. Uh, and then at the end of the day, uh, you'll be able to come back using the same public link to um, make comments as, as part of the open mic. Um, so let's get started. Um, so th this panel, as I mentioned, has to do with evidence of infringement. It's going to follow roughly the same roadmap that uh, the first session this morning did. First, we're going to, I think, talk in a, in a broader way about uh, the types of evidence that, that uh, the Copyright Office should consider, what type of evidence uh, broadly is, is relevant to assessing this question. Uh, then I think we're going to move towards more specific examples uh, that, that folks have raised. Uh, in terms of identifying um, claims of infringement against against states. Um, then we would like to talk about uh, the standard uh, that the court articulated um, in terms of what it means for infringement to be intentional, uh, what, what level of uh, intent is required to satisfy the constitutional standard. And then finally, we're going to talk about um, any effect that uh, sovereign immunity may have in your experience on uh, licensing negotiations involving copyright owners and states. Um, so just to kick things off, if we could, if I could ask all the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, let's start with uh, Dr. Bell, please. Uh, my name is Dr. Keith Bell and um, I'm in private practice. And um, Mr. Bynum, are you on the are you on the phone? I think uh, I see your name. I'm not I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Bynum is on. Let's go to, um, is it, I hope I'm pronounced, forgive me, is, is it Leo, uh, Mr. Leo? You got it. Uh, good morning. My name is Devin Leo. I'm a senior assistant attorney general with the Colorado Attorney General's Office. Um, we advise executive grant state agencies, except for some of the higher educational institutions in the state. And I just need to make a disclaimer that uh, any comments that I make today are not made on behalf of any of our clients or uh, state agencies. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Levine. My name is Melissa Levine. I direct the Copyright Office at the University of Michigan Library. Um, I also am a lecturer for the University of Michigan School of Information, where I teach a course on intellectual property <coughs> and information law. And one mentioned that I'm part of, uh, I'm a founding member of a working group that established rightstatement.org, which is geared towards providing uh, relevant intellectual property information for education and cultural needs. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McDonald. Good morning, everybody. My name is Angus McDonald. I work at the University of California's Office of General Counsel. <coughs> handle copyright matters for the entire University of California system, which comprises 10 UC campuses, five medical centers, and three affiliated national laboratories. I just want to thank the Copyright Office for hosting this roundtable uh, to discuss this significant constitutional issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Molnar? My name's <clears throat> Isaac Molnar, I am Intellectual Property Counsel for the Ohio Attorney General. 
Uh, in Ohio, the Ohio Attorney General is required by law to represent every state entity. Uh, and as IP counsel, uh, 40 AG copyright claims, cease and desist letters, et cetera, come to me. So I have a pretty good idea of copyright infringement issues in Ohio. Thank you. Um, Ms. Murphy. Hi, I'm Kristen Murphy. I'm the director of the American Chemical Society's Examinations Institute, and I'm also a professor of chemistry and biochemistry at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And finally, uh, Mr. Wasson. I am a private practitioner in, uh, in a law firm based in Michigan. I uh, am up here today on behalf of the American Intellectual Property Law Association, AIPLA. And uh, as Mr. Leho did, I'm going to uh, just disclaim that I'm not speaking today on behalf of uh, myself, my firm, or my clients, but rather on behalf of the AIPLA. Great. Well, thank you all again. So as I mentioned, I, I would like to start at sort of a higher level in talking about um, you know, what sorts of evidence uh, is relevant. And I actually, Mr. Wasson, I'd like to start with you if I could. Um, in APLA's submission, um, uh, you, know, you listed a number of copyright infringement uh, suits that, had brought, that have been brought against states in the past, I believe, two decades. Um, Mr. Bynum also submitted a, a lengthy list of uh, infringement actions brought against states. I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about um, your view in terms of what that, what we can draw from that sort of evidence in terms of assessing uh, the prevalence of infringement by states. Sure, thanks Kevin. So in our in AIPLA's submission, we identified uh, 19 different written decisions from uh, litigated cases that uh, that are available online and in publicly available databases. Uh, the what, what's interesting about the cases themselves is the breadth of works and of state agencies that were involved in the cases. So the works themselves include such uh, diverse examples as photographs, video recordings standardized tests, books, uh, book chapters, graphic designs, paintings, software, databases, teaching materials, and research reports, uh, which speaks to the wide swath of creators and creative institutions that are impacted uh, by this sort of activity. And the defendants in these cases uh, included state-sponsored commissions, institutes, foundations, boards, bureaus, educational institutions and hospitals. Um, again, reminding us that at, when we speak of abstract terms like the state, uh, it really encompasses a broad range of entities with whom creators may interact uh, and, and entities that may otherwise use copyrighted materials that non-state actors would, would need to pay a license fee for or, or face uh, recrimination for infringing. Uh, our members, which include both um, private practitioners, in-house counsel, um, counsel for public entities, but a, a, a wide, a wide number, a large number of private practitioners uh, who are in, in the trenches day in and day out uh, fighting these cases, uh, strongly suspect that this is really only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, as any practitioner understands, uh, the, the number of cases filed versus the number that actually result in a, in a published opinion uh, it, it, there's a wide discrepancy between the two. And the, the number of unreported, settled, or never filed lawsuits is uh, almost inevitably much higher than what we see from these 19 different cases. Uh, in addition, the, the cost of litigation and the obvious futility of bringing infringement claims against state entities, uh, we suspect and we understand anecdotally, um, it would deter a number of cases that might have otherwise been filed. Uh, it's, it's important to remember here that as the, uh, the Supreme Court itself explained in the Allen decision, uh, the, the writing has been on the wall for the CRCA for at least two decades uh, before the, the court finally acknowledged its death. Uh, the, the vast majority of lower court uh, decisions had already decided that the CRCA was unconstitutional and practitioners know that. So not only the, the number of uh, creators uh, understand that the, the remedy is, is, is futile, but the attorneys who would otherwise file those cases on behalf of the creators understood that those cases were futile. Uh, and so th this really 
um, to sum up, these 19 cases we believe are, are the tip of the iceberg on the infringement that is actually occurring. Now, I mean, so that's an interesting point. I mean, because you're right, and, and one of the points that you know we've we've heard in the comments uh, is the fact that, as the court you know said in the Allen versus Cooper decision, the law after Florida prepaid was fairly clear that um, that uh, sovereign immunity precluded claim, copyright claims against states. So, um, I mean, is it? So, in in some ways, you know, it seems surprising that there would continue to be. Uh, significant numbers of, of cases. Are, were you able to determine to what extent these cases involved um, claims for damages against states as opposed to, for example, um, you know, claims for injunctive relief uh, brought against individual state officials? So we didn't drill down uh, to that level of specificity in terms of gathering uh, hard data and, and numbers, but uh, our read of these cases that each of them, the, the plaintiffs sought damages and, and that would have been, you know, would have been something they sought, but for the fact that they were uh, stymied by immunity. And is it your uh, understanding, you know, just from having looked at those cases that essentially they were efforts to distinguish uh, the CRCA from uh, the Patent Remedy Act that was that was addressed. I mean, were they essentially trying to, um, you know, make make the argument that notwithstanding Florida prepaid, uh, sovereign immunity uh, did not uh, apply. Yeah, again, the the level of uh, legal analysis and the, the strategies used uh, vary from case to case, but all of them uh, in one form or another were, were trying to get the relief that CRCA otherwise would have provided. Okay. Uh, Mr. McDonald, it looks like uh, you've raised your hand. Would you like to weigh in on uh, the usefulness of, of uh, this evidence? I would. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I just want to provide a little bit of context because I did review the AIPLA submission. Um, and in response to the question one about specific instances, as uh, Mr. Wasson pointed out, there are 19 examples, but it was over the span of 36 years. If you look at the first bullet, one of the, one of the uh, earlier cases that's bullet pointed in the AIPLA's AIPLA submission, it's from 1984, and it goes through um, instances of 2020. 19 examples over the course of 36 years does not seem like an overwhelming amount so that, that, that would necessitate um, abrogating the constitutionally protected sovereign immunity. I also think that these examples, these bullet points are, are not entirely probative for the uh, copyright office's inquiry. Um, I, I, I haven't heard and I haven't seen anything in the AIPLA submission or in other submissions um, that of any proof or evidence or, or a determination that setting aside 11th Amendment sovereign immunity, the state defendants did not have meritorious or at least plausible defenses that had they been fully litigated, they may have prevailed. I, I, I think it's going to be that level of inquiry that's going to be required based on whatever is available in the public record on these various matters, most of which did get dismissed at an early at an early stage because of sovereign immunity. Um, you know, and there's there's another reason why I just think that this bullet pointed list is not entirely probative. It, it simply purports to identify how state entities responded in response to a copyright infringement lawsuit by relying on their constitutionally protected sovereign immunity, among other defenses. It doesn't actually establish that any of these alleged infringements at the time of the alleged infringement were done with intentional or reckless intent. And, and that's the standard that we're talking about. I think it's gonna be far more probative to actually look at fully litigated cases, cases involving public entities that for whatever reason, sovereign immunity didn't apply. And I'm sure the Copyright Office and others on this panel are aware of the Georgia State litigation where the publishers ended up losing 
uh, on, on almost all accounts um, and ha having to actually pay the cost of Georgia State or the Authors Guild versus Hathi Trust matter involving uh, the University of Michigan, the University of California and other state institutions. I'll pause right there. Thank you. No, so you've, you've raised a number of important points that I wanna sort of take in turn here. Um, you first mentioned the, the number of cases, um, I guess there were 19 in the AIPLA's submission. I, if, if Mr. Bynum is on the phone, uh, I would like to invite him to uh, weigh, on and weigh in on this uh, question of, of sort of, you know, the, the number of, of cases that are relevant here. Um, Mr. Bynum, are you there? issues are. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some are going to be more probative than others. That's that's fine. It's not meant to be a, a smoking gun, but it's certainly uh, indicative, we feel, of, of the state of the law and the, and, and the state of uh, infringement activity that's going on. Um, and the cases are all there. They're all accessible in public databases uh, for you know, the world to read and the office to, to, to study as well. And certainly if, if the office would um, invite AIPLA's further submission and analysis of those cases, that's something that we could provide. Uh, I would say though that um, 19 issues, 19 cases on an issue that ought to have already been uh, so clear as a matter of constitutional law. I, I think, Kevin, to, to, to your point, uh, you kind of, I, I read a suggestion in your initial comments uh, that uh, that's actually a fair number of cases uh, compared to, um, what the understanding should have already been there. Uh, as a litigator, I know that there are a number of issues that I wish someone else would have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars litigating fully all of the various possible defenses so that we would have a robust public record uh, of what the merits of each of these arguments would be. But I can't expect another party to do that. Well, right, so just to maybe um, turn back to you, Mr. McDonald, and I wanna bring others in too. Um, I mean, you, you made, you know, an important point, I think, in noting that it's not clear from just the fact that these cases were filed to what extent the states may have had other valid defenses, um, you know, whether the, the copyright owners ultimately would have prevailed. I think, you know, from our standpoint at the Copyright Office, uh, the question is, um, you know, what, what other evidence it, I mean, the, the, the problem with us using those cases is the fact that they've, you know, the, the merits are not able to be addressed because of sovereign immunity, right? You know, so they're, the cases don't really provide a vehicle uh, for us to assess, you know, whether there were uh, meritorious defenses, uh, et cetera. So do, do you have sort of thoughts about other sorts of uh, evidence or, or ways that we can use these sorts of cases to make this assessment? Yes, I do. Um, well, as I mentioned, there are some fully litigated cases where um, sovereign immunity, for whatever reason, was not at issue um, or did not preclude um, a, a decision on the merits. And, and I cited a couple, um, and there's an extensive record in the Georgia State litigation, um, as well as in the Authors Guild versus Hathi Trust litigation. I do think that, that those cases are gonna be far more probative than um, uh, you know, uh, 19 cases that have been dismissed at a motion to dismiss level. That's, that's point number one. The second point that I think in terms of looking at evidence and I do um, respect and admire and, um, and I think it's going to be a, a, a significant project by, by the Copyright Office to really get into the evidence. Uh, but one of the questions in the notice of inquiry, which is question 1F, is whether the infringement was committed pursuant to a state policy. I, I, I have looked at uh, most of the initial comments as well as the reply comments submitted in, in response to the notice of inquiry. I saw no evidence whatsoever of state policies um, that where, where the state institution had a policy of we're just going to infringe and not worry about it and rely upon sovereign immunity. I think we heard from uh, Mr. Throw of the University of Kentucky, who provided some um, elucidation 
about what is really required here. We, it's a de facto policy or a pervasive pattern or practice of infringement. Again, I, I, don't, I don't see that. Um, the third point is that I, I really do think it's gonna require um, going into the public record for a lot of these cases and a lot of the um, points that Mr. Bynum and uh, AIPLA had submitted to see what is raised in um, the, the, the motion to dismiss. Was it purely sovereign immunity or were there meritorious other defenses um, that were raised? Um, just by way of example, I did carefully look at the AIPLA um, um, submission and, and, I, and I did look at uh, Mr. Bynum. There was a reference uh, and I was looking specifically for the University of California. Um, and there was a reference to a 1987 case um, called BV Engineering versus UCLA. And in the second paragraph of the district court's decision, which of course um, granted sovereign immunity, it specifically said that the defendant's regent's motion is based on various grounds, including a claim that defendant is entitled to immunity from suit under the 11th amendment. Uh, and then in the two sentences later, this, the court says it does not reach the remaining issues posed by the parties on their motions for summary judgment. The point being is there are typically many meritorious defenses that are raised, uh, at least in my own practice and from what I've observed with other state institutions, um, aside from the sovereign immunity. And I do think that those need to be carefully looked at. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to, Mr. Wassum, I see you've raised your hand. So I'm going to um, go back to you quickly. And then I, I would invite particularly um, uh, folks uh, from states to, to weigh on this question too. I mean, I would, I would say, you know, at least on its face, the fact that, you know, we have evidence of, uh, of up to 160 cases filed against states uh, since 2000 for copyright infringement. Um, seems noteworthy. And so I wonder if other uh, state representatives agree with Mr. McDonald, um, you know, that, that we sort of need to look at those cases on a more granular level to, to determine whether there's, there's sort of a, a pervasive issue. But uh, Mr. Wassum, you wanted to respond? Uh, thank you. Two quick points and I'll pass the mic. Uh, the, the first is it's the number of cases that either were never filed or were filed at the complaint stage and abandoned, um, the, which are the, the, the data uh, that's provided so far suggests that number is going to be orders of magnitude higher than the number of cases we can actually identify with decisions uh, that were reached. Uh, the second being, uh, Mr. McDonald's point is a great one, that, there, that state entities have a wide variety of other defenses available to them. And once the state, once, if in fact the CRCA, that, that remedy was, was readopted and sovereign immunity no longer became an issue, now we'll be able to actually litigate those and, 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 and be able to determine their merits. And the availability of those defenses is a great reason for state entities to, to not fear that the sky is falling just because the CRCA is reinstated. They have another, uh, a wide variety of other defenses to fall back on. So the, the, the impact on those state agencies is likely to be muted by those defenses. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Leho? Yes, yeah, so one of the things that I wanted to, to comment on is that um, is the number of, of, of cases and, and the number of allegations we get of infringement. So while it's true that state agencies do occasionally receive emails or letters uh, alleging that they've infringed an author's work, when I say occasionally, I'm talking about a handful of allegations over a multi-year period. I've been in our office for over 20 years, and on average, our office receives maybe one infringement allegation per year, and that's across all of the different state agencies that we represent. So I think it's really important to understand that. This isn't some pervasive pattern of, of even allegations that the state agencies are, are infringing authors' content. Uh, yes, Mr. Molnar. Yeah, and I would just follow up uh, from Ohio. I, I, as an IP counsel for state of Ohio, I've been in this position since 2012, uh, so going on nine full years. And I have, I went back and counted how many cease and desist letters I've had to deal with for all our state entities, two-year colleges, four-year colleges, state agencies, and it amounted to seven over the course of nine years, it's just cease and desist letters. And of those seven, we actually, there were two or three that were meritorious and we settled. We paid the 
paid out um, some judgment, and that's a matter of public record. So um, they just don't come up very often. They really don't, at least in my practice. I would, like I said, I think this is consistent with what Mr. Leo said. I would expect to see a cease and desist letter once, maybe once or twice a year. So you mentioned paying out um, settlements or, or paying damages. Is yeah. that is, is that um, the state's typical practice when um, presented with uh, an infringement claim? I mean, do, do you undertake an assessment of the merits and if you find it meritorious, um, you know, try to work out a financial settlement or is it typical that you will um, assert sovereign immunity? So, so uh, and I don't know what the law is in the other states, but in Ohio, there's a pretty easy workaround to 11th Amendment immunity. So the state will be uh, potentially on the hook, regardless of whether or not we assert 11th Amendment uh, immunity or not. And that is, you can sue, um, you can obtain a public records request, find out the individual who's actually responsible for the copyright infringement, sue them in a personal capacity, and under Ohio law, we represent them and then indemnify them. So there's a, we're, we have to be very cognizant of that risk. So we really assess the merit of claims in where we've had to, where we've had meritorious claims like clear copyright infringement, we've settled, period. I mean, we're also the chief state law enforcement officer and it's not a particularly good look in our opinion to use the 11th amendment as a way to, you know, as a technicality to avoid following the law. So we have two different approaches, but they work in, I think, the same way. So, so you were talking before about, um, I assume 1983 suits against uh, state officials in their personal capacity. Is that what you were? Well, you can sue, you can sue um, an individual in their personal capacity for copyright infringement, just a copyright claim against that individual. We've had to deal with that case. We had a case where, we had a case where um, our agency was the Department of Natural Resources was sued and we dismissed that on 11th Amendment grounds because it was not a proper suit. But they brought the suit again and we, we told them if you know who did it, if you have a name of individual, which they did, then you need to sue them in their personal capacity and they did. But I'm talking about, you know, situations where the state employee is acting, you know, pursuant to, uh, state state policy or acting you know in in their capacity as a state official and in that circumstance you would need to bring the action under 1983 i gather right and and the the um the official would be entitled to qualified immunity so i don't I, i'm not sure that you would bring it under 1983 i mean the claims that i've seen and where this has come up, it's been a claim for copyright infringement. Now, district courts that have considered it have said qualified immunity applies in that case. Okay. Uh, Mr. McDonald, you've raised your hand. Yes, th thank you for, again, allowing me the opportunity. Uh, the, the answer is yes, we do pay um, from time to time. Uh, I don't have any sort of specific numbers, um, but in response to um, credible, meritorious claims of copyright infringement where our own defend or defenses separate from sovereign immunity are in my opinion um, not very strong. Um, I do recommend some payment um, to, to settle the matter because we respect copyrights. We have various policies that, um, that, that require us to adhere to copyrights. We're, we're subject to the Higher Education Opportunity Act, which requires annual copyright disclosures or potentially our federal funding is, is withheld. Um, so yes, we, we, we do pay on occasion. I would say it's it's certainly less than 50%, uh, but but certainly greater than 0%. Um, and, and, and in a few instances, we have settled on um, sometimes in addition to payment or sometimes in lieu of payment to take corrective measures with the uh, aggrieved um, copyright owner. Uh, one such example was where a co college radio station 
um, had to um, uh, impose some um, educational um, requirements to all of their new employees um, about copyright and copyright infringement and the bounds of fair use. So those are some of the examples where we do take measures, including payment, in response to credible copyright infringement claims. Great. Um, I do want to turn to uh, some of the copyright owners who have raised um, specific uh, allegations of infringement that they've experienced by states. Um, Dr. Bell, I'd, I'd like to start with, with you if I could. Um, uh, you have um, submitted comments I, through, the, through the Copyright Alliance um, talking, alleging numerous infringements by multiple state entities. I was wondering if you could just give a brief sort of overview of those um, situations and, and uh, the, the types of infringements uh, that you're claiming and, and how the states have responded. Okay. Um, well, again, I, I think this is just the tip of the iceberg, but I've identified um, more than 130 universities, uh, um, public universities, uh, who have infringed or whose employees have infringed upon my copyright. Now, the question of whether it's meritorious, uh, we probably would disagree on many of them, um, but that's something I'd like to see happen in court rather than just dismiss, uh, not being able to go after them because of uh, sovereign immunity. I have uh, in Ohio, um, uh, um, I, I uh, uh, wrote a cease and desist and the only response I got was uh, so we claim sovereign immunity. Um, uh, University of Texas is uh, particularly of interest to me. It's a great university and uh, I got my master's there, my doctorate uh, and did postdoc there and worked there. Um, and uh, they have a very strong brand, make a fortune on licensing their works um, and are well respected in the community with uh, what their policies are. But when I uh, had multiple infringements by employees of the University of Texas, the only response I got was sovereign immunity. Um, so let, let's just back up. So, you are you have a number of books that that you've published yes correct um, so what could you describe sort of the nature of the infringements that you're experiencing what are, what are the states actually doing uh with with your works so um i've written uh, 11 books 10 of them on sports psychology and human performance psychology um, um I have a copyright on the book, uh, Winning is a Normal, and a separate copyright on the main, the heart of the book, the main passage that I wrote the book around, also called Winning is a Normal. Um, all of my books have been infringed upon, but Winning is a Normal, Winning is a Normal in particular, has been hugely infringed upon. It's been distributed, um, disseminated, uh, by out to uh, disseminate out to millions of people, literally millions of people, without any kind of remuneration for them. Um, some of it is very clearly willful. Um, uh, the University of Louisville, for example, um, uh, each of their uh, eight of their sports um, infringed on my copyright, um, gave attribution to anonymous. And, um, uh, and at least one of those sports had um, prior warnings from the national governing body in that sport. And yet uh, the um, um, infringement continued after. So what, what exactly was the infringement? Did, what did they do? They made, uh, well, uh, first of all, they um, uh, infringed upon my right to, to how it's used. So, for example, I have a number of, uh, I have a, a particular derivative of the uh, passage winning is a moment that you have a, a copyright on. 
that is is um, contain has is going uh, just being distributed widely right now, and it has a phrase in there that's illiterate and um, nonsensical, and that's really really very embarrassing to me as an author. I, um, uh, that bothers me though. They've been uh, uh, distributed unbelievably widely. I have one particular derivative that has been um, uh, copied and disseminated um, millions of times. And, um, uh, and, and a very important part of my concern with this is that because of all the infringement on my works, I've stopped writing. I was very prolific in getting a bunch of books out in a fairly uh, short number of years. But the, the amount of theft that's gone on um, makes it very difficult for me to uh, um, collect and, and uh, uh, stop um, people take stealing my work, um, particularly if it's on the news. I've, um, I think that hurts society that uh, people such as myself stop writing. Um, I know you've you filed you've you know asserted claims uh, in a number of courts uh, infringement suits, um, and so in those cases is the typical response uh, or is sovereign immunity one of the uh, defenses that states have typically raised. I don't think so. In that. I'm not sure, but I don't think so in those particular cases. But I, I, I just, there are hundreds of cases that I haven't pursued because of somber immunity. I can't afford to do that. And I can't afford to take them to trial. And I think that, that um, uh, my goal in um, ascending a cease and desist is to get them to stop, but I also want um, there to be a deterrent effect to stop other people. So, um, for example, I've had uh, multiple infringements from Northeastern State University, and um, uh, they did it over um, it, many of their sports and their recruiting office and some of the other administrative offices. I, I just couldn't go after them with sovereign immunity. Um, uh, the university's license their brands, their trademarks, their patents, and their copyrights. And, and they make sure that even their own employees, um, they own what their own employees do a lot of the time. And, 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 and if their employees um, on their own then go use it, then they go after their own employees. They also punish students for that kind of behavior. I find that a problem. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's helpful. I do, I do just in the interest of time want to um, move to, uh, I, I believe Mr. Bynum, are you there now? Hello? One of these times, this will work, but uh, apparently not yet. Um, okay, I, I would like then to turn to um, uh, Ms. Murphy. Um, uh, you've uh, talked about um, infringements um, of, of various pieces of intellectual property that, that the American Chemical uh, Society has produced. Um, could you talk just generally about uh, what sorts of infringements uh, by states you've experienced? Of, of course, um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so just so um, everyone's clear, I'm actually part of- uh, I'm part of the um, Division of Chemical Education, which is a technical division of the American Chemical Society. And of that, we have a, an entity called the Examinations Institute. And that's what I lead. We're a very small group, unlike our, our parent organization, um, ACS. Um, we've been around since uh, 1934, and we produce standardized tests in chemistry. Um, these are used by um, many institutions, currently over 2,500 institutions use our exams in some capacity. 
um, and we hold secure copyrights on our test items. Um, because many of our tests are used for final exams, our test lifetime is actually quite long, um, depending on the, the area. So, you know, a, a general chemistry or organic chemistry test might only live um, as a released or active test for maybe four to six years. A uh, physical chemistry test might live for, you know, 10 to 12 years because it takes so long to develop these exams. Um, the types of infringement that we've experienced over the, the um, number of years that I've been director, and that's um, a little over five years, have included um, actions by employees of institutions where they've either photocopied our tests or they've, they've translated our materials into um, either study materials or their own exams um, using learning management systems or directly using paper tests, uh, most commonly using learning management systems. Um, and then the other component of this is where um, the secure site that is supposed to be set up in which the tests are administered is not in fact as secure as it needs to be. And students then are the ones that um, either um, take pictures of the exams or they, they remove tests from the site. Um, and then that uh, obviously compromises our items. Uh, we've had um, fairly good experience being able to um, work with institutions that infringe, that are private, that are not part of state institutions. And um, we've been able to seek some damages and be able to, to um, really the more important thing, not the damages, but the more important thing is to be able to correct action so that the, the infringement doesn't continue. Um, we have a number of ongoing situations though with entities that are part of state institutions Sometimes they're actually state universities, sometimes they're connected to state universities and it does become a bit murky um, where we have come up against sovereign immunity almost immediately. In fact, um, I'm a chemist, I'm not a lawyer. So I, I apologize for, for not being well versed in what so many of you are, um, but the lawyers that we work with oftentimes will tell us that we're simply not able to pursue things simply because it's a state institution. And we, we stop at that point. Um, we, we certainly make every effort to be able to have the materials removed, but oftentimes that falls to us then because there's nothing we can do. We have to recall tests. Thousands of dollars are, hundreds of thousands of dollars are spent on our side. Um, and like I said, we're a very small group. We have 60 products that we're trying to protect with about five people. Okay. Um, let me just jump in. It sounds to me like we have some background noise so if everyone uh who's not speaking could... Kevin I think that may be Mr. Bynum actually um oh wait let me just Mr. Bynum can you hear us I think I can mute him okay um Thank you, Ms. Murphy. Let me, I just want to ask a couple of clarifying questions. So you, you produce, um, are, are they model exams? Uh, I, I'm interested in sort of what your normal marketing practices are, how you, you know, who are your customers for, for these sorts of materials? What's, what's the normal business practice? Right. So, so our, our customers are actually faculty um, and instructors in departments. So um, to go to a procurement model or license for university just doesn't fit our, um, our product because it's simply not widespread use by a university. It's only used by chemistry departments. Um, and the, the customers range from high schools all the way through um, our one universities. And so I, I wasn't totally clear. Have, have you encountered situations where you've contacted um, states or, you know, a, a municipality or a, a, a state entity um, and brought an infringement to their attention? And what has their response been? Uh, we have been told that under sovereign immunity that they, they, that we have no recourse. This, and at that point we've dropped it. Can you tell us what state or states have, have said that? Um, I'm not, I, I don't think I can disclose that. Um, some of these things are actually ongoing investigations at this time. So I'm sorry. 
I'm just trying to be very careful. I understand. Uh, and have the states said that they intend to keep using the materials? It, okay, so and that's that's where it comes to. We're looking for corrective action primarily. Um, it's less about getting damages and more about correcting the action so that items stay secure. Um, and that's been somewhat successful in terms of being able to work with faculty to to provide a secure environment so that it doesn't continue to happen. Um, and we do get corrective action in terms of it, you know if it was a if it was a willful act by an instructor have it to have it removed. Um, but the you know that's too late at that point. You know we have to recall the test and we are the ones that have to pay the cost associated with that. And we can only sustain so much before. I mean we are a very small entity. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to try one more time uh, with Mr. Bynum. Uh, are you are you there, Mr. Bynum? Mr. Bynum, are you there? Mr. Bynum, are you, are you there? Hello. Yeah, we can't, we can barely hear you. Mr. Bynum, you may need to change your audio to, to call in. Um, I will um, try to help you um, offline in the, by, by IMing you directly. So if you can't do that yourself. Yes, uh, I would I'd appreciate your help. Okay, yeah, I think I think we may have to wait until we get that sorted out because I'm I'm just not able to um, hear you, unfortunately. Um, I want to now turn to um, the the issue of intentional um, infringements and and to what extent um, there is evidence that. Um, infringements by states are rising to the level of uh, intentional infringement articulated by the court. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, um, Mark Gray, to ask some questions about that. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so yeah, as Kevin mentioned, um, in Allen v. Cooper, one of the things the court was concerned about is um, whether copyright infringement was being done intentionally, uh, recklessly, or um, negligently. Um, and so uh, to kind of understand how we at the office should think about that while we're going through the study, um, one of the things we are kind of uh, trying to figure out is generally um, when infringement claims are brought to a state, how does the state respond? And so I think um, we already heard from Mr. McDonald a little bit to this um, and just a minute ago from Professor Murphy, um, but uh, Dr. Bell, could you speak a little bit more? You mentioned that there was one instance where they said uh, they raised immunity, but could you speak to any others? believe you are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. So um, one of the things I wanted to comment on was that I missed before was that um, I have a tremendous number of infringements from public schools and um, uh, way more than from public universities. And I haven't um, uh, gone after them because of sovereign immunity, although I have a few where they have responded to um, uh, cease and desist by claiming sovereign immunity. Particularly, uh, Kojin, I think in, in this case was um, uh, one of the school districts in Michigan, which claimed that it was state policy um, 
that uh, um, that the state a sovereign immunity was state policy in in Michigan, um, and um, because of that, it's it's really uh, uh, had me cut back on the number of of uh, uh, claims I've made to public schools in Michigan. Um, and the, uh, a couple other things that are of concern is being able to, other people, um, um, private schools, private universities, um, uh, um, vendors, um, teams, all who buy multiple copies of my books um, are, are, uh, can't really compete with that. It's not fair to them. And for me, one of the problems with um, uh, copyright law right now is that um, there are cases where many people claim, oh, gee, it's innocent infringement. And that we'd, I'd like to be able to litigate that, um, but it's really difficult to afford doing that. But, and they have the right to, to go uh, uh, make proposals uh, or try and argue fair use or things like that, but it, it's a situation now where a lot of them go and say, it's all over the world, my work. There are millions and millions of copies of it out there. Uh, how can, uh, all anyone has to do is claim that they got it from an illegal source to muddy the waters on the merits of that, of that copyright. Uh, and they'll claim innocent infringement, which we can, I, I'm happy to litigate, but I don't think it's just innocent infringement just because they got it from an illegal source instead of getting it directly from me. Um, so if I can ask two quick, oh, sorry. Can I ask two quick questions about that yeah. actually? Um, so when you say illegal source, do you mean that, um, that they're claiming that they obtained it from a school district or another state entity? Uh, sometimes, yes. Uh, sometimes okay. they don't know where they got who whose it was. It's just all over the internet without any attribution or inappropriate attribution, mis misstated attribution, or uh, anonymous or no attribution at all. And so they say, "Well, gee, you know, I couldn't possibly have known." And of course, they can. They have at least uh, constructive knowledge that it's my work. It's very easy to find that out. Great. And then my second question is, uh, you mentioned um, a Michigan school district saying that it was the state policy of Michigan. Um, could you give a little bit more examples of that? Is, or do you mean like they adopted your work as part of a curriculum or, or what kind of policy? Um, what I was told by that entity was that, um, uh, that there was sovereign immunity and it was state policy. And they gave me some number and I can't remember the number of it right now. Um, but they, but uh, they told me it was state policy. Okay, um, in that case, I think Mr. McDonald actually wanted to respond really quickly. So would you go ahead, Mr. McDonald? Okay. Thank you, Mark. And I, I promise to be brief and I appreciate uh, your repeated indulgences in allowing me to speak. I just wanna briefly respond to Dr. Bell. Um, uh, the winning isn't normal. I, I actually read the heart of that book, uh, the passage that has been copied uh, on, on, according to Dr. Bell, numerous instances. It's a powerful statement. Uh, it was inspiring to me to read it. Uh, I have, and, and the University of California has great respect for authors. In my professional capacity and pro bono work, I represent many of these authors. However, with due respect to Dr. Bell, I think it's a very curious case study for uh, the Copyright Alliance to highlight Dr. Bell um, in its submission and, and the, the, uh, the APLU and the AAU reply submission talks about Dr. Bell's recent track record of litigated matters that have, um, unfortunately for him, have not fared very well. He mentioned the school district in Michigan. There was a school district in Ohio, the Worthington, Worthington City School District, where he lost on a litigated matter, not sovereign immunity, on fair use, it's, it's referenced in the Copyright Office's Fair Use Index, Southern District of Ohio, June 2nd, 2020, a fair use decision in favor of the school district where the court specifically talked about how it was not addressing the other arguments raised by the defendants, including a de minimis infringement and innocent infringement and no vicarious liability. 
Um, also in 2019, Dr. Bell again lost his case with prejudice in the Bell versus Magna Times case in the District of Utah, April 29th, 2019. Um, again, fair use. Um, in most, the most recent, in my jurisdiction, the Northern District of California, Dr. Bell on October 14th, 2020, this year, less than two months ago, was ordered to pay $120,000 in attorney's fees to a small nonprofit pool club and $2,000 in costs to the defendant. There were a lot of statements about um, um, exorbitant settlement demands, extortionate settlement demands, and not advancing the purposes of the Copyright Act. In let me just let me just jump in, and I, I certainly take the point, you know, that we we want to. Um, look carefully at the merits of, of all the cases that that folks are alleging. I, I don't want to go sort of too far down the road of, um, you know, assessing uh, specific claims uh, in fine detail. I don't know that we have time uh, for that today. But one, I, I, I do want to ask sort of the, the broader point that we discussed a bit during the first session, which is what, what does it mean uh, what, what sort of evidence should we be looking towards in deciding whether um, infringement uh, activity by states is intentional? Does that mean that, that the state actor has to you know, know uh, what they are doing is unlawful um, and you know, they do it anyway? Or can intentional mean that they intended to do the conduct uh, but they may have a, you know, a, a reasonable basis for concluding that something is, is fair use or is otherwise lawful. Uh, Mr. Molnar? Yeah, so um, I, I would view it more as more towards the former. And I, I'll just give you an example of what we do in Ohio. And this is for every state agency and, and anyone who asks. We have a fair use assessment where if someone wants to use a work uh, in some way, whether it's for a class, and even for a public records disclosure, because we are, in fact, reproducing, potentially reproducing someone's copyrighted work for a public records disclosure. Even for that, we go through and assess, or they'll have me assess, whether or not, uh, what, what we think in terms of whether it's fair use or not, and make a determination. Some of them are close calls, and some of them are clearly fair use, in my opinion, but um, to me, that's being careful. I don't think that's being intentional. I think that's a, a state showing a respect for copyright laws and not necessarily just willfully going out and infringing someone's copyright. Uh, yes, Mr. Leo. And, you know, earlier I had mentioned that the, the, the small number of, of complaints that we've seen over the many years. But the other thing that I think is notable that goes to the question you're asking right now is the intent issue. And the occasional violations that we've seen are typically the result of a lack of familiarity with copyright principles, or it could be confusion related to the scope of licenses that either the state or a vendor may have. And I'm not personally aware of a single instance, even of the small number of instances of, of alleged violations we've seen, where an agency intentionally violated an author's intellectual property rights. And one thing I wanted to go to as well, because I think it's important, is in the first panel, one of the speakers mentioned a situation where copyright information had been removed from an image and that the entity had then used this image with the, the removed copyright information. And that, that was a subject of discussion for several minutes. I think it's important to understand that the copyright information may have been removed by a completely different entity and then placed on a website where that website may even be attempting through the internet to get people to search, for example, free images online. That, and I think it's much more likely that a, uh, a state employee is going to be searching free images, finding something that may in fact be a copyright image, the image that they're not authorized to use, but they think they are because the search they did was for free images of whatever it is that they're trying to post on their website. And I, th I think it's important to understand that even in instances like that, where it may appear on its face that there was intent because copyright information had been removed from an image, that it's often the case that it is not the a state employee who has actually done that removal and that they've innocently obtained the image from a different um, website. Thank you. And then I guess maybe to, uh, I guess an, in the hypothetical instance, speaking purely in hypotheticals, um, if a state employee did 
infringe intentionally and you you figure that out during your investigation, um, you know, would there what kind of penalties would that person face sort of in the employment context? Uh, if, the, if the question is coming back to me on that one, um, I'm, I'm yes. not involved with the employment context of that. Um, uh, typically what we, what we do, what we found though, is that when we've identified that there may be a potential infringement is that the, the content is immediately taken down. But from the employment side, I, I, I don't have um, any information I can share on that. And Mr. McDonald, do you have any experience with that either? I do not. Um, I, I have no experience whatsoever about uh, an employee that has uh, intentionally infringed and um, uh, what the consequences are because we've never gotten to that point. Um, hypothetically, if, if there were a situation like that, um, that would be deemed uh, at the very least as a violation of our um, university policy, which has the same force and effect of state law. Um, and so appropriate um, sanctions might be levied against that individual um, staff member or faculty member. Moreover, if the decision is to ultimately pay um, uh, some sort of settlement fee, which I think we probably would in an intentional infringement type of a matter, um, it would come out of the department funds. Uh, and I think the department chair would take appropriate measures uh, against that particular individual for having to pay um, for a third party infringement claim. Uh, yes, Ms. Murphy. Can I just ask a question here? I mean, when it goes to intent, you know, I, I understand that that's an important component as far as the law goes or, or potentially what you're seeking here, but it doesn't change the fact that the copyright gets violated. And in some cases, the what might be, be perceived as I'm, I'm following copyright law and I'm, I'm, I'm using this whatever um, material in, in a fair use setting, if it destroys the value of the materials, does it really matter what intent is? I mean, the, the, the cost to the copyright holder is still the same, that the materials are now destroyed and they have to go back and they have to create something new. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're trying to get at here is the the um, constitutional standard that the court, the Supreme Court, was talking about in the um, in the Allen case, where it talked about the fact that um, you know not every copyright infringement necessarily rises to the level of a constitutional violation, and that intentionality um, is is relevant to that analysis. Could I just go back quickly to you, Mr. Wasson, and then I do want to. Just to preview, um, we're going to then ask about licensing practices. And Ms. Levine, I know you've been patient. And um, so we're, we're, I think, probably going to direct the first question on that topic to you. But just quickly, Mr. Wassum, um, I know in your comments, uh, you, you did uh, discuss this, this question about, whether, uh, about what intentionality means in this context and whether um, it can be distinguished from willfulness. Um, could you just, you know, could you describe your view on, on that question and, and whether you think, um, you know, what, what showing you think is required to establish intentionality here? Sure, very briefly, I, I, would, I would refer you to our, our written comments where we do have a discussion on the fact that there can be daylight between um, intending to commit copyright infringement and negligence. There can be a degree of intentionality uh, that, that rises to a cognizable level that, that ought to be uh, taken into account without it uh, being uh, an intent to break the law, especially where the law here is so unclear. Uh, but there is case law to support that. And um, I refer you to the, to the written uh, comments for a, a more in-depth ex explanation. Great, thank you. Um, I do. I think now we would like to talk about uh, licensing practices, and so I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague Melinda Kern. To oh, Dr. Bell, did you have? No, I just wanted the opportunity to respond to, to uh, Mr. McDonald. Uh, so, um, in the case in California that he spoke of, um, uh, the judge in that case 
uh, said very clearly that I may very well have had a very good case, but he did, I think the judge did what he was supposed to do because it was a failure on my attorney's parts to, to put any evidence it, it, to the court. And um, uh, we all know that there's some great people in every field and some people who don't do very well in every field. And um, we uh, copyright holders um, have to depend a lot on on the um, attorneys who handle matters for us. And it's, and it's not easy to get necessarily get the best attorneys to come very expensively. And um, in the case in Ohio, uh, also um, uh, my attorneys uh, uh, filed uh, against the wrong party and um, uh, some other factors like that. And those things are gonna be cleared up and there are gonna be some bad decisions, but um, there's also been a lot of of uh, 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 clear cut issues and, and better uh, settlements in cases. Okay, thank you. I, I think we are gonna move on to, um, yes. to uh, licensing practices. Uh, so Ms. Kern, you can start with that. Thank you. Um, so the first question that I want to address is basically what role um, do uh, sovereign immunity and other pen potential defenses play in choosing whether to negotiate with copyright owners. And I'd like to um, start with Mr. Leo, Mr. Molnair, Mr. McDonald, and then finish with uh, Ms. Levine. So for, from a licensing perspective, I, mean, I, think, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, state agencies, it's very important um, to make sure that we protect authors' rights. And our office works with state agencies in Colorado to ensure that our agencies are not violating authors' intellectual property rights. We do license a lot of content um, through, the various, through, through various state agencies because it's, it's important to, to recognize um, the value that these authors put in, into, their, into their works. Yeah, in Ohio, I would say close to none. I mean, I can't think of an example in a actual business to business licensing situation between a state agency or a university or two year school where we have suggested or said that we are not gonna pay as much because if of 11th Amendment immunity. It just, that's not something that would enter the calculation. Oh, it's my turn, um, but I would um, echo those other comments, which is sovereign immunity plays no role, um, uh, as far as I'm aware, on our licensing practices. Um, uh, system-wide, I did some research system-wide at the University of California. We pay approximately $100 million every year in library content. Um, if Why would we pay such exorbitant sums if we would just um, intentionally infringe or have a policy of infringement. Some campuses play, pay well into the tens of millions of dollars um, a year. This is just library content. This is separate from a lot of other content that we license for. But again, I, I'm not aware of sovereign immunity ever playing a role in uh, our licensing practices or getting a discount on our uh, licenses. Um, hi, I can only echo what some of my colleagues have said, um, and I want to refer back to the previous panel when Dean Smith mentioned that in working both with public and private institutions, he never had an experience where sovereign immunity was discussed as a strategic component of a decision regarding a particular situation. And I've been at the University of Michigan Library for a little over a decade. Um, I've worked at Florida International University, another state university. I've also the privilege of working at the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian um, federal agencies. And never in any of those situations has sovereign immunity come up as a strategic tool for blocking otherwise bad behavior. Um, Michigan currently in our library, we spent in the range of $29 million 
on collections, meaning things that we license and purchase. It's gone up over $10 million in the years that I've worked there. Um, that does not include software, grand licenses, performance licenses, and the millions of other dollars worth of intellectual property that we purchase and license. Um, this has come up in several uh, themes throughout this conversation, but the university environment, like the state, is an ecosystem. Um, if uh, I'm not aware of any state policy encouraging or permitting uh, violation of copyright by public school districts, I find that um, quite surprising. Um, the school districts also spend lots of money on these materials and there's not, uh, it, it doesn't make sense uh, that there's intentional infringement um, that's reckless or widespread. The University of Michigan's Ann Arbor campus um, uh, embodies in the range of 100,000 people. So we have about just shy of 32,000 undergrads are currently. Um, just shy of 17,000 graduate students and about 51,000 employees, all of whom are subject to the law of the state and of the nation, all of whom can either be uh, fired, dismissed, disciplined, expelled under our employment rules, under our uh, university policies. Um, and I, I just don't, I don't see the, um, the larger, the, the larger issue vis-a-vis -vis state immunity, sovereign immunity, excuse me. Thank you, thank you for those comments. Um, so the next question I'd like to ask, um, Mr. Wassum, I'll reference um, one of the statements in APLA's comments, basically that said that state sovereign immunity detracts from content owners bargaining power to license works to state entities. Um, because a large uh, percentage of U.S. Inst educational institutions are public or at least partially funded, state funded. Uh, so collectively, those uh, institutions have substantial market power to drive down the licensing fees. So um, I'll start with you. My question is kind of a three-part question. Um, can you provide any specific examples on these practices? Do you believe that the negotiation table is slanted before parties even reach that table? And then relatedly, and I believe some of the panelists before touched on this, is there any evidence of how licensing terms for states um, differ in terms of those offered to private entities? And I will start um, with you. And then if we can hear from Professor Murphy and Dr. Bell, and if Mr. Bynum is on, uh, we'll hear from him as well too. Sure, uh, thank you, Ms. Kern. In the interest of time, I'll uh, collapse your questions into one answer. Uh, and that is we, we don't have specific data that AIPLA specifically has gathered on that, that these are, um, these are conclusions based on, on the case law that we've discussed and the anecdotal information we have available to us and a logical extrapolation uh, from that data. But, uh, but no, we don't have specific uh, case examples to add to the conversation on that point. Um, in the case of uh, Exams Institute, we don't actually seek licenses. We don't go through the procurement offices to be able to do that simply because we operate in such a small area. We're only in chemistry. And so therefore, um, I've been informed that our ability to be able to seek such a, a license is, is likely not to be effective. So we don't go that route. And Dr. Bell, did you have anything to add or? I believe you're muted. I believe you're muted, sir. I offer very reasonable licenses to institutions to use my work. The problem is social media. And so um, uh, people can license my, an institution can license my work for less than the cost of, of a poster or a book that I sell. And uh, often, most often I get from universities are teams, right? Coaches that are using my work to inspire uh, performance, to motivate performance. Um, but instead of sending it out to 
12 people on the wrestling team or 30 people on the uh, basketball team or uh, 120 on the football team, they put it on social media and send it out to millions. Um, and it, it's made it so I, I just, it's too damaging for me to uh, license to so for social media work, right? But that's what they're using it for. And, um, and when they do, of course, they are violating their contracts with Twitter or Facebook. Uh, and those contracts are not with me, they're with them, but I'm harmed by those, right? So when they misrepresent that they own my work to social media uh, platforms, uh, I'm tremendously damaged in that, right? And I'm happy to offer licenses and I offer deep discounts for licenses for um, modest use of my work, right? But if they're gonna put it out to a million people, I can't afford to license that and they can't afford to buy it most of the time right? without it being hugely damaging to both of us. Can I ask a follow-up Can I ask a quick follow-up question? Um, I guess primarily to the um, representatives of, of states. So, I mean, the the clear theme I think that you're expressing is that, you know, it's either exceedingly rare or almost unheard of for states to assert sovereign immunity in, in licensing negotiations. Is there a little bit of a disconnect between that and the fact that states certainly have not hesitated to assert sovereign immunity in litigation? I mean, um, you know, North Carolina obviously took the issue all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, there have been numerous other cases that uh, have been brought to our attention where states have uh, asserted sovereign immunity. So I, I wonder what your thoughts are in terms of, um, you know, how, how common and how sort of important the, the, the defense is and practice for, for states in, in responding to copyright claims. So I think, um, at least from my perspective, that in the context of a licensing negotiation, we've already entered into that arrangement, presupposing or kind of acknowledging that the work we're trying to use is of a value to state, and that if we we're going to use it, otherwise it'd be copyright infringement. Where we've asserted the 11th Amendment immunity has been in, in cases where the cease and desist letter is brazenly just of no merit. And that's where we tend to think of, it's where we would use the 11th Amendment as a way to avoid having to litigate a case that is just merit, lacks merit. Where there's been meritorious claims, as I said, we've settled, paid $120,000, paid $9,000. Recently, we just paid $1,000 for example of uh, someone who downloaded a picture that didn't have any attribution. So they, they thought it was okay, they used it. We got a cease and desist letter, we paid it out. So I think the 11th Amendment from my perspective as a defense is, is against, is a way for the states to save money uh, against frivolous litigation. Mr. McDonald. Thank you, um, Kevin. That, um, that's a great question. Um, I see no disconnect and here's why. Um, universities, public universities are copyright stewards. Um, we are copyright um, owners, large copyright owners, co copyright creators. We have lots of faculty that, that, that publish. Um, we need to be good adherents to copyright law, uh, which is why we pursue such vast licensing programs and have such a high volume of staff that are devoted to um, licensing. I see no disconnect between that and in litigation assuming that settlement discussions have, have not um, produced a settlement and, and a litigation uh, occurs to cite and rely upon sovereign immunity among other defenses, because in addition to being copyright stewards, we are financial stewards, we are public trusts. And if there is a way to, uh, you know, to, to articulate sovereign immunity as a basis for dismissing the action when there are other meritorious defenses, as opposed to going through the cost of discovery, 
um, and going through a summary judgment phase, financially, from a, as a financial steward, we have to, we have, a, we have a fiduciary duty to raise a constitutionally protected immunity. Um, and so for that reason, I, I just don't see any disconnect. Mr. Uh, Lawson. Uh, two points real briefly. The, the first is the, the troubling aspect of, of the defense we just heard is that it's the sovereign deciding when the lawsuit, when the claim is, is frivolous or not. Uh, all other defendants have to have the court decide that for them. Uh, and, and what we're hearing is that we'll, we'll offer you what we think is fair. And uh, if you don't like what we think is fair, then we'll exercise our trump card with sovereign immunity. The second point, too, is that we're hearing from a lot of, of uh, representatives of, of state agencies that do have very defensible and very noble and honorable policies. Um, but back to my original point was the, the case law encompasses a wide variety of, of state agencies that aren't universities, that don't have that, that respect for, uh, for copyright and respect for creators. Uh, the, the Allen B. Cooper case, of course, was a state board of uh, tourism or some, some such thing. Um, it, it, there are uh, commissions, foundations, bureaus, all sorts of other agencies out there uh, that perhaps don't have the same respect for copyright that a university would. Anyone else like to respond to, to that issue? Yes, Mr. Yes, I, I mean, <laughs> Oh, you, the uh, sovereign has to agree to. Oh, I'm sorry, I think you cut out for a second there, Ms. Lyon. Could you say that again? The sovereign has to agree to be sued. That's how sovereign immunity works. We are still all bound as, as attorneys, if we're attorneys, to faithfully um, uh, apply the law. Um, and uh, as Mr. McDonald said, um, I'm not a lit litigator, um, but there's a responsibility to raise um, available and legitimate defenses as part of your responsibility as an attorney. Um, so, but it, it's, that's all I need to say. Mr. Malma, did you have a response? Yeah, I, I mean, representing state agencies, we certainly in Ohio respect copyright law through our, all our state agencies. Um, and again, I just do a circle back to a point I made at the very beginning, I would read uh, it's a case 57 F sub third 985 uh, from the district of Minnesota that outlines how sovereign immunity applies to suits against the state, how it applies to suits against individuals in their official capacity and how it applies to suits against individuals in their personal capacity. And I would recommend, especially as an IP attorney, become very familiar with suing someone in their personal capacity. That is your way around the level of feminine immunity, full stop. And then, um, Kevin, do we have time for one quick follow-up question? Um, Mr. McDonald, you mentioned um, towards the beginning of this panel how I believe you said you quoted it as corrective measures in terms of when um, you saw that there was infringement um, with a radio station and in, I'm not sure if it was in lieu of payment or what there was education provided. Um, were there, do you have any other examples of corrective measures that you've taken um, when there's infringement? Sure, um, and, and, and your um, recounting is, is correct. In that particular instance, it was actually in lieu um, of payment. Um, well, of course, an injunction, uh, a self-imposed injunction um, is a corrective measure that we take. We say we're gonna take it down. We disagree with the merits, uh, but to resolve this matter swiftly, we'll just take it down. I think that's a, that's a corrective measure. Uh, we also make promises at times that uh, that we won't ever put it back up again. Um, um, so you know, and and if if copyright owners come to us, and again, we are ourselves major copyright owners. Um, you know, if if they come to us and offer other creative solutions, um, we'd be happy to entertain them, including financial payments um, that are less than the sums that um, are asked for, which we think are. Um, unreasonable in many instances. 
Thank you. Uh, okay, well, we are just a bit over time, but I think we've made up some ground. Um, so I think we are going to uh, close this session. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for participating. This was very helpful. Um, our next session begins at two o'clock. Uh, so we will see everyone then. Thank you very much.